The following podcast is from Pathway Community Church. More information about Pathway can be found at www.pathwaycc.net. Please enjoy this podcast, and we pray that God will meet you while you listen. All right, so we're going to try that again. Good morning, Pathway. Good morning. There we go. That's what we're after. See, that works. All you got to do is just get some blood flowing, right? Uh, Hey, if you're here this morning and you're a visitor, I want to welcome you here. We are starting an Advent series. Advent is really the whole idea of new beginnings. Something is coming. And, uh, And so we're talking this morning about Wonder Awakened. Wonder Awakened. And uh, it's in terms of the theme that we're doing for our Advent series. And we're going to be starting in the book of Luke, Luke chapter 1. If you got your Bibles with you, or if you got your Bible apps open, I'm going to get you to go to Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1, and we're going to be going, and I'm going to be reading here. Where do I want to start with you here? Um, I'm going to start reading with verse 59. Luke chapter 1, verse 59 is where I'm going to start. And one of the ways we like to respect God's word here at Pathways, we like to stand for the reading of his word, so would you please stand with me. Now, for those of you who are wondering what's going on here, in this passage that I'm going to start reading from is we've got the birth of John the Baptist, but prior to the birth of John the Baptist, his dad, Zechariah, who was a priest in the temple, uh, the angel Gabriel had made it so that he was not able to speak. Now, wives in the room here are probably pretty excited about that notion. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I just heard some guy, hey, my wife would love that. We know what she's getting for Christmas. <laughs> All right, so this is the story of what's going on, and, and Zechariah wasn't going to be able to speak again until his son was born. So this is where we pick up in the birth of John the Baptist, starting with verse 59. On the eighth day, they came to circumcise the child, and they were going to name him after his father, Zechariah. But his mother mother spoke up and said, No, he is to be called John. They said to her, There is no one among your relatives who has that name. And they made signs to his father to find out what he would like to call him. And so he asked for a writing tablet. It's a little different than tablets we got nowadays. And to everyone's astonishment, he wrote, his name is John. And immediately his mouth was opened, his tongue was free, and he began to speak, praising God. And all the neighbors were filled with awe. There was a wonder that was taking place. They were all filled with awe. And... Throughout the hill country of Judea, people were talking about all these things. And everyone who heard this wondered about it, asking, What then is this child going to be? What then is this child going to be? And the rest of the message that we're going to have this morning is going to be talking about what this child was going to be. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, I thank you so much for this morning. I thank you for joy. I thank you for the Christmas season. I thank you for Advent, this idea that you were beginning something new, and Lord, that we still live in a sense of Advent here. Lord, would you help us to recapture the wonder of this season? In your name I pray. Amen. Uh, You can have a seat. One of the things I know with absolute certainty is that there's a lot of excitement around this time of year. Now, a lot of excitement around this time of year for a few reasons. One of those reasons is a lot of people are very excited about this thing called Black Friday. How many of you are excited about Black Friday? Some of you are just like, no, I hate crowds. How about Cyber Monday? Nah. Okay, how many of you just don't care? Oh, you guys are awesome. I love that your season is not defined by the shopping. How many of you are excited about Christmas? Yeah, that sounds exciting. I want to go to your place. <laughs> yeah, real exciting there for you folks. It's good. Christmas is actually an exciting season. It really is. And, and, and we know that because all over the place, there is this sense of anticipation that's around. People flock to Netflix to find their favorite Christmas movies. There's Christmas movie lists that people come up with. And they say, here are the best 10 uh, Netflix Christmas movies. And they all tend to be these weird, like, Hallmark-type movies that people like for weird reasons. 
But the season is structured in such a way that we spend weeks thinking about it. And we spend weeks thinking about the kinds of gifts we're going to buy our loved ones, things that they will enjoy. When we think ahead towards the day when we see their faces light up with the happiness of the gifts that they receive, and then we finally know what things people have gotten us. Had this conversation with my son last night. He's thinking about whether or not he's buying presents for everybody this year. And he's like, but dad, like, you're, like, what would I get you? And I'm like, I don't know. I don't need anything. Don't get me anything. You should ask Janet. I am the worst person to shop for because I just don't want anything. <laughs> I'm super frustrating to shop for. Uh, and so I'm a disappointment and it's okay for people. <laughs> So I just appreciate whatever is there, and, and I just don't need stuff. So my son is trying to figure out, he wants to get excited about this stuff, so I need to figure out a way to get excited about getting stuff, and it's just not my thing. You know, I just like, I like to give. I don't, I'm not good at receiving. Um, and so this season, we get to experience the joy of giving as well as the, the joy of, of receiving the gifts. And there's this month-long almost anticipation, Right? How many kids are in the room? Raise your hand if you're a child in the room. Okay, how many of you are excited about opening up Christmas presents? Yeah, we got somebody just rising tall right over there. I got you. Another one over there. Because Christmas is exciting, right? Christmas morning is so exciting because we have this excited anticipation of the event until it finally arrives and then we experience the joy of that morning. Christmas morning would not be so joyful if we weren't excited for it. Would you agree? I'm not talking about the gifts. I'm saying Christmas morning itself would not be as filled with joy if we weren't excited for it. And we should look at the biblical Christmas in the same way as we do at secular Christmas. We should anticipate the joyous occasion of our Lord's incarnation in the same way we anticipate giving and receiving gifts on Christmas morning. And we can do this by discovering three elements of anticipation in Zechariah, in, in the response of Zechariah to the birth of his son. Now, if you're going to continue following along, we're going to be looking at verses 67 to 79 of Luke chapter 1. But this is Zechariah's response to the birth of his son. And also a response to the question that people were asking in verse 66, what then is this child going to be? For the Lord's hand was with him. So they knew that something was up with this kid. Something was unique. Well, let's give you a little bit of history about Zechariah. Zechariah was an older priest, and his wife, um, Elizabeth, they were without kids. They could not have kids. And Gabriel, the angel of, like one of the archangels, came to Zechariah in the temple when it was Zechariah's turn to burn incense in the te temple before the Lord. So Zechariah appears, sorry, Gabriel appears to Zechariah, which if you could well imagine, you're about your business, and all of a sudden there's an angel there that might mess with you a little. It would definitely mess with me. I was like, oh, it's not like greetings. It's, there's a reason that whenever the angel of the Lord appeared, for example, or whenever Gabriel appears, he typically uses phrases like this, be thou not afraid. <laughs> Why? Because we're afraid. <laughs> Things like that don't just happen in life, right? So the angel appears, and he told him that he was going to have a child, and Zechariah was like, well, okay, hang on a second. I'm an old man. My wife is not able to have kids. How is this going to happen? How is this even possible? And so when Zechariah asked this question, Gabriel shut his mouth. He says, you ain't going to speak now until it comes time for the naming of your son. He couldn't speak until it was time for his son to be born into the world. And after John was born on the eighth day, when it was time to circumcise him and name him, everyone asked if he should be named after his father. And Zechariah took out this tablet, and he wrote his name is John. And he was then allowed to speak again. After nine months of silence, Zechariah spoke the anticipation of waiting for the birth of his son culminated in this burst of praise from Zechariah, as well as further anticipation of the promises of God that would be fulfilled through his newborn son, the son whose job it was to prepare the way for the Messiah. So how do we properly anticipate 
and appreciate the real reason for this Christmas season, the birth of Jesus. I want to suggest to you that we're going to look at three elements of Zechariah's song, it's called, his prophecy, and then we're going to apply those things to Christmas. So here's the first one. If you've got your bulletins out, if you're taking notes along in your bulletins, here's the first one. The first one is this, that we remember what God has done in the past. Zechariah recaps what God had done in the past, and he starts with verse 69, and he goes over to verse 73. Here's what he says. He has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David, as he said through his holy prophets long ago, salvation from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us to show mercy to our ancestors and remember his holy covenant, the oath he swore to our father Abraham. And so he sums up what God had promised and had done in the past, what he promised to Abraham and what he promised through all the prophets. And it's It's through the past action of God in bringing his people out of exile, of promising them a new covenant, promising them a Messiah who would lead them back into right standing with God, that God created this present situation where the Messiah was coming soon. Remembering what God had done in the past helps us to have a proper perspective of our present. Anticipation of Christmas hinges on the memories of the excitement of the past Christmases. Remembering what God has done through the Christmas event can help us to build excitement for the Christmas season, culminating in that joyous celebration on Christmas morning. So we look at the past, and yeah, we revisit the Christmas story. We revisit the birth of Christ. But not only do we revisit the birth of Christ, we revisit all the prophecies in the Old Testament that lead to the birth of Christ that starts in Genesis chapter 3. It starts in Genesis chapter 3 where the prophecy of the Messiah begins. And so we remember the goodness of God in the past. Secondly, we recognize God's action in the present. Verses 73 to 75, it says, to rescue us, sorry, for 73, uh, second half of 73, the oath he swore to our father Abraham, to rescue us from the hand of our enemies and enable us to serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all our days. And so Zechariah is seeing God's sovereignty in the present. He recognizes the past, and he sees something going on in the present. He realizes that God has shown mercy on the Jews by bringing them out of exile. By allowing them to rebuild the temple and giving them enough autonomy of of separateness to be able to worship God without any oppression. He recognizes this. And he realizes that God's action in the present, by seeing the bigger picture of what God has done in the past to create this present situation, we got to recognize that God has shaped the past to get us to the present, and he will always shape our future. Recognizing God's action in the present helps us to build anticipation for Christmas by seeing that God is still active and in control. He's still active and in control. And that the plan He's implemented on Christmas morning continues today. Thirdly, anticipate the future that God has promised. In verse 76 to 79, 79, it says, And you, my child, will be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go on before the Lord to prepare the way for him, to give him this special, sorry, to give people the knowledge of salvation. Because of the tender mercy of our Lord, by which the rising of the sun will will come to us from heaven, to shine on those living in darkness and the shadow of death, to guide our feet to the path of peace. Zechariah recalls the message of the angel and the prophets in his own prophetic song here about what God will do with his son through the, through the Messiah that he anticipates. And we look forward to Christmas morning with anticipation. We should look forward to the celebrating of God's work, his redeeming work of mankind, starting with the birth of a baby boy. Since that event is in the past for us, we should look forward to to celebrating the birth of Jesus as well as celebrating his return and hope for a new world that he promises. So here's what we do. We celebrate the past. We, 
We acknowledge what's going on in the present, and we anticipate the future. This is what we do at Christmas. You want to talk about how we keep the Christmas joy alive in our hearts, how we don't lose the meaning of Christmas, of the birth of Jesus in our Christmas season? We remember the past. We recognize the present. We anticipate the future. That's what we do. We make it a time of worship above all other things. That's what we do. So how does this apply to our everyday Christmas? Christmas is hard to anticipate if we try to do it exactly the same way Zechariah did. It's difficult to anticipate since it includes the past looking into the present that is for us in the past than looking into the future that is for us in the past. In other words, if we were to just try to simply look at it the way Zechariah looked at it, we couldn't because we're not living Zechariah's life and we're not in that day and age. You see, we've had the privilege and the vantage point of looking at it from the perspective that Christ was born, that He lived, He walked the earth, He did ministry, He paid for the, He died and paid for the sins of mankind, He rose again three days later. That's our vantage point. And so there are two ways we should anticipate Christmas that make sense of this, as well as give us a fuller and more significant excitement for the season. We should anticipate Christmas as if we were there, or at least try. In the past, we look at the promise of the Messiah, in the present, the birth of the Messiah, and in the future, the redemption of God's people from sin and death. We should anticipate Christmas as a post-crucifixion, resurrection Christians. In the past, the birth of Christ, His life, His ministry, His death in our place, His victory over death, that's what we look at. That's what we look at. Because that brings us to that place of worship in this season that gets so muddy and filled up with all kinds of things that can distract us. We look back at what was done, what was the most important part of the story. Jesus' birth, his life, his ministry, his death in our place, and his victory over death. But in the present, the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives, his plan for our lives, and our desperate need of him, that's our present And so we acknowledge that present. We acknowledge our need of Him. And we begin to live life in Him. And then in the future, the promise that Jesus our Messiah will return. The resurrection at the end of of our future life with God. We read that in Revelation 21, 1 to 6. Revelation 21, verses 22 uh, to 22, verse 5. God promises us that we will live with Him. That's our future. There's going to be no more sickness. There's going to be no more death, no more pain, no more darkness, no more fear, no more hunger, no more sin, no more curse that it brings. We will dwell in the glorious, holy, merciful, just, and love with with the glorious, holy, most merciful, just God forever in eternity. Christmas is exciting. It's exciting. It is the beginning of the work of our Lord and Savior. It is the miracle of God's love. It is the event in history that is grounding the grounding of our future. Christmas looks to the cross, the empty tomb. Christmas is the beginning of the act of, that God took to redeem His creatures, His creation. Jesus went to the cross for our sins and died in our place, but first he had to be born of a virgin and live among us. The empty tomb that Christmas looks forward to promises the same thing that Christmas celebrates in the birth of Jesus. New life. New life. Christmas looks forward to God's new world. Through the work of his newborn Messiah, our redemption and future are assured, and we should anticipate Christmas in the light of the person and work of Jesus. He came and lived among us, taught us what it meant to love God, how to live, healed our wounds, took on our sufferings, wept with us, and then he died in our place so that we might have life and be reconciled to the Father. And if so much of what I'm saying 
about the hope of Christmas has to do with the things that we talk about during Easter, and you, one could ask, well, why not just skip Christmas altogether and just focus on Easter? Because Christmas celebrates the miracle of God's mercy taking on flesh. That's what it does. Christmas focuses on Jesus, God in flesh, dwelling with us. This is the incarnation. It teaches, sorry, there's teaching and there's healing us. There's dying in our place. Christmas celebrates with hopeful anticipation the future work of Christ in light of the past beginning with the excitement and hope of the newborn Jesus. And so we should get excited about Christmas because it's the day of promises fulfilled. That's why we get excited about Christmas. It's the day of promises fulfilled. It's the hope for the future work of God. It's the starting point of our faith. Christmas is much more than Santa and presents. It is forgiveness for sinners, healing for the sick, hope for the poor, peace for the restless, mercy for the merciless. It is redemption for both the Jew and the Gentile. That's all of us. And so the response of anticipation when Christmas comes is the praise of our God. Zechariah praised God for what he was doing in the future Messiah, and we can praise God using the same words for God's work in Jesus for the future of when he comes again. Now, I will confess to you that I've cut my message short. I have cut my message short for a very specific reason this morning. We have missionary friends in the mission field, And they're undergoing tremendous attack right now. Um, We believe that that Christ is able to overcome all things. And in his Christmas season, the hope of a promise of of God's prophecies is, is both fulfilled and celebrated. We believe that Jesus is King of kings and Lord of lords. He's the ruler of all things. We believe that when Jesus returns, that one of the things we're going to see is that every knee will bow, every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, we know that he is above all things. And so there are missionaries that we want to be praying for this morning who are in need of that reminder, of that confidence. The name of of, uh, Don and Char Epp, some of you may remember them. They're in the Philippines working with uh, an unreached people group called the Agda. They were here at once once upon a time, and, and they gave a presentation to us, and it was powerful and wonderful. The ministry that they're doing there is incredible. And I believe firmly that the evil one doesn't like the ministry that they're doing there. So here's what they're dealing with right now. They're dealing with significant demonic attack. They've got, as my latest understanding, uh, about three people currently that they're working with at exactly the same time near their home that are demon-possessed right now that they're struggling to figure out what to do with and how to get rid of things. Now, I know that there's a lot of theology out there about what to do with these kinds of things. What I can tell you very simply is this. They need Jesus. Jesus is the answer. The gospel is the answer. And there's some scary things taking place. And so we need to be praying for them. So here's what I want to do. I want us to just take a few minutes, pray with the person beside you for Don and Shar and family against whatever it is that the evil one is attempting to do, especially this time of year where we are to be about celebrating Jesus incarnate, celebrating that Jesus is relevant in our world today, then to this morning, why wouldn't we proclaim the fact that Jesus is still relevant and present in our world today by praying together against whatever is taking place in the Philippines today? Take a couple of minutes with the person beside you. Pray for Don and Char Epp against what is taking place. Lord Jesus, we recognize that we live in a world that has darkness on all corners of that world, and there are times that we face that darkness in dramatic ways. And so, Jesus, right here, right now, we pray that whatever darkness is coming up against the ministry that Don and Shar are having for you 
with the Agda people, Jesus, that whatever is taking place, whatever hold that the evil one has over there, that you would make it known to Don and Shar and the other believers that are there so that we know how to pray against whatever it is that's taking place. Something unique is happening, Jesus. And we believe that where something unique is taking place, where the evil one is attempting to show his power, Lord, when you crush that power, you proclaim your name and you glorify yourself and people come to know you as Lord and Savior. And so, Jesus Christ, I pray that you will make your name great that you will show yourself to be all-powerful, that you would use Don and Shar and the other believers there to break this hold that the evil one has on the people that they're working with. Jesus, that, that there would be a recognition that where you are present, there is no other authority, that you are ultimate, and that where your gospel is proclaimed, where your Holy Spirit is received, the evil one must flee. And so, Jesus, I pray that people will receive you so that they might be free. In this season, when we think about the Advent, when we think about your coming, when we think about the fact that you have a desire to be present in our lives and relevant in every aspect of our being, Jesus, I pray that you will show that to be true also with the Agda, that they will see you and glorify you, and that this day would be the Advent of the new life that they can have with you. Jesus, would you help us to be a people who remember the past, who look at the present, who anticipate the future so that our wonder can be reawakened in your majesty. Amen.